Good evening and welcome to tonight's Nats Chat with Dr. Ian Howell. I'm Kari Reagan, the organizer and host of Nats Chats, which are generously sponsored by Inside View Press. And I am so looking forward to discussing psychoacoustics with you, Ian. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Glad to be here, Kari. Thanks. So um, a brief, just a brief bio on Ian. He was as a countertenor and I would describe him best as an innovative thinker. A conversation with him leads us so many directions, the mind boggles. He is on the voice faculty at New England Conservatory of Music, a frequent presenter at PAVA, Nats, and other associations. He, Ken Bozeman, and Chadley Ballantyne run an acoustics vocal pedagogy seminar in the summers. And so again, welcome. Ian, start us off just a little uh, with some beyond the bio, something that we wouldn't read um, in your bio that tells us how you came to the work you're doing now. Sure. Well, um, so like most countertenors who end up going into singing perception, I started off as a percussion major in my undergraduate. I thought I wanted to be a high school band director. Um, I made my living playing steel drum professionally for about five years uh, in Columbus, Ohio. I knew all of the, the background vocal parts to basically every Jimmy Buffett and Bob Marley song uh, that was ever recorded. And, um, and th that was kind of going to be my life until I had this opportunity to join Chanticleer. And uh, once I joined Chanticleer, it kind of took me all over the world and, and um, really pushed my energies towards uh, the singing thing. Um, it, it's funny too, because I, I think a lot of people who don't know me for my singing and sort of the performing part of my career, but know me for the more academic um, part of my career, kind of assume that I was always like this. I, I had to be dragged, just like kicking and screaming, to go back for every degree that I ever did. Um, I did my master's, you know, a decade later than most people do them. I did my doctorate probably 15 years later than most people do those. Um, so in, in some ways, I'm I'm a bit of a reluctant academic. Um, I certainly love it, but if you'd asked me 20 years ago where I would be right now, this is absolutely not where I thought I would be. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly have grown into it very naturally. So it lived within you, obviously. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's launch a conversation about psychoacoustics with a conversation about what psychoacoustics is. Great. Yes. Yeah, so, so this word is a little, um, a little confusing, I think, to hear, especially because we hear like psychoacoustics, and um, we think that has something to do with like mental derangement somehow. But um, psychoacoustics is is literally just the study of how um, we perceive sound. And um, it's as simple as that, and also just as mind-bogglingly complex as that. The, the material that I'm going to present today, um, some of which I, I think is sort of my original thought, and a lot of which is just sort of gathering information that other people have, um, have figured out and trying to sort of bring it into the story that we tell ourselves about how the singing voice works. Um, this is just literally scratching the surface. There's, you know, better than a century's worth of, of, of research and scholarship and, and imagining about you know, what, what it is that sound perception means. So if anybody's brain is kind of turned on by this material, I'm like I can tell you the next book to read. <laughs> this, oh. is not, this is just the beginning of it. Um, so um, psychoacoustics essentially asks us to think about how it is that, <clears throat> how it is that the ear and the hearing brain um, change our perception of uh, the sound just in our environment, sounds if we're focusing on something deliberately. Um, and it's, you know, in that way, it's not different from, you know, any of our other senses. I, I think any of us are, are comfortable with the idea that, you know, if you see, if there's two people walking hip to hip, very far away, when you first become aware that there's something there, your eye won't be able to resolve that there's two people. Like that's that's not a foreign concept for any of us. Um, there were always two people in reality. Our mm -hmm. eye mediated our experience of that um, information as it came in. And so in our brain, we had what's called a percept. We had a, an image in our mind that there was one person. In reality, there were always two people. So psychoacoustics is not dissimilar to this. There is a pressure wave 
in whatever medium, generally it's air, we're talking about singing, there is a pressure wave. Um, and it has physical properties and it, it has a, a reality to itself. How that pressure wave interacts with our sense of hearing, um, it becomes changed and it becomes transformed. And the way in which it is transformed becomes the percept of how we hear the sound, essentially. Um, and it's not insignificant. The, the mediation of the ear can have a profound impact on the sound itself. Is now a good time, as I ask, <laughs> as I ask, as I ask <clears throat> that feedback. let me turn this down, um, uh, of the word percept. Yeah, um, it's, so this is a term that comes from from psychoacoustics, um, and it's I you know I recognize it's it's kind of it's a new term to bring into voice pedagogy, and I, I don't really do it lightly. Um, you could think of it as just like my own perception of the sound. That's what a percept is. It's just sort of the the noun version of the thing you are perceiving, and I think it just cleans up a little bit um, the idea that there is essentially the sound as it exists outside your sort of neural cognitive experience of the sound. And then there is the phenomenon that is the cognitive experience. Um, and it allows you to draw a line and say, well, what's the same and what's different between these two things? So I see you have um, a, a slide show slide going. Yeah. Shall we just launch in a little bit? And yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, before before we get to that too, I'd I'd love to just say, um, broadly speaking, um, for anybody who's new to this information, this is this is probably going to feel like a lot, and it was a lot the first time I came to it, and like the smartest people that I know, it's a lot the first time that they come to it. Um, so I just want to I want to encourage everybody to, I mean, one just you know have an open mind about it. Looking okay. good. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I, I don't remember exactly where we tailed off, but um, essentially the, the first pass at this information is, is a little bit of a heavy lift. And so I want to encourage people to, you know, keep an open mind, like allow yourself to be a little, uh, if I can say, a little confused about how you're going to use it in your teaching studio tomorrow. Um, I think a lot of this information, it... Um, it's, it's really about changing what you are aware of that you are hearing. And I feel like like real mastery of it, like the ability to apply it automatically in a variety of dynamic settings, um, it can take a little bit of time. And so I just wanna encourage people like, we're kind of babies at this, we're babies at psychoacoustics of the singing voice. Um, and so my, my main goal is tomorrow, like everybody will be one day old at it. And we'll just be able to notice like a few things that come up um, because a lot's going to come at you and a lot will kind of wash over you. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, my my main goal with all of this and then we'll get to to my slide stack. Um, like I want to I want to suggest that we currently actually have perceptual models that we're using when we consider the singing voice. Um, we, we currently have models for understanding the acoustics of the singing voice and you know what spectrographic technology means and what we should be taking from it. Um, and so I, I kind of have two goals. One is to poke at those models a little bit, just to see whether they're actually showing us what we are really perceiving um, rather than how a computer might mathematically take a sound apart. Um, but then, you know, the other thing I want to do is I want to try and give everybody just a couple of tools that will um, allow them to look at these models, to look at spectrograms, to look at power spectra, and um, like think about like new ways to interface with that information. I, I kind of want to make us better at reading them mm -hmm. um, so that we have a sense of what it is that we're actually seeing. Um, and so to this end, my, the big thing that I'd, I'd like to do is, or one of the big things I'd like to do is I want to add two subsystems. So we, we love talking about the subsystems of the singing voice. We love talking about respiration, phonation, resonation, which is distinct from articulation. Um, and I want to add two more subsystems to our base, basic model. Um, the first of which, number five, is radiation. I think we need to be thinking about how sound propagates and how the room that we're in might change the nature of that sound propagation. And then the last one is perception. I think we need to be thinking about 
how it is that the ear is, you know, effectively um, changing the physical nature of the sound wave and also removing and introducing information to that experience. So with that in mind, this is my plan to really hammer home this idea that the ear limits and colors reality and that these rules inform the sound of the singer and that a simple framework uh, can accommodate these rules in real time. It's fun to do like crazy complicated research uh, projects on a voice. Um, but I also want everybody to know like you could, you could leave this, this session today and you'll be able to hear one or two things that are slightly different in real time. So the big takeaways are that the ear and the hearing brain process sonic stimulation, and they also create aspects of sound. So that means that if we can understand the limitations and the behavior of the ear, that will tell you what a singing voice can sound like. So then here's our first challenge, which is, do you see what you'll hear? Um, if you look at an image like this, and our, our pedagogy books are, are, there's a smattering of images just like this within our pedagogy texts to explain color in a voice or to explain vowels in a voice. Um, and my question is, looking at this image, do you actually see what you will hear? Or do you just see like a general sense that the voice might have warmth or brightness, but you don't actually have a sense of what this singer's sound will be? Um, we're going to take a quick pit stop and just talk about language cognition because it's very hard to talk about vowels. And it's very hard to talk about the history of research that led us to where we are right now uh, in terms of uh, the way we talk about vowels acoustically without talking about language cognition. I want to argue that singers shape sound and at a most basic level we just use contrast and opposition and you know it it can be high, low, loud, quiet, fast, slow, bright, dark. Um, and there are a number of, of these oppositions that we use just uh, every single time that we sing. Um, some of these sounds and some of these contrasts also convey language. And I think it's very important that we realize that the word that we perceive from a singer is not the same thing as the singer's tone color because a singer's sound is so much more varied than that. So if we think about limits of language cognition, generally we are taught, and this is how I was taught, this is how all of us are taught, that um, the first and second vocal tract resonances or the first and second radiated spectral peaks um, determine the vowel, and that this is essentially all that is needed for vowel identification. So I wanna go through a little thought experiment uh, with all of us here, and I'm going to pull up a sound file. So let's say, Kari, you and I are space aliens, and we came down to Earth in our ship, and we were exposed to this amazing machine. <laughs> called a cello, right? And, um, and we've never encountered a cello before. And, and what we want to know is like, well, we want to understand this cello. Let's study this cello. Um, if we turn to the literature that came out of Bell Laboratory, uh, that came out of the research tradition that essentially gave us um, the telephone, right? If we, if we read up on all of that literature, essentially we'll be told uh, that there's a fairly narrow frequency bandwidth that is required to understand uh, a human speaking voice, to be able to differentiate various phonemes. So if we listen to a singer as well, and if we apply that research from Bell Labs, we would squash down the frequency bandwidth to kind of about here. We listen to that same region in a cello. Did that come through, Kari? It did come through. 
history. Um, so it's not, you know, it does not sound like the singer did, um, but it is not un ah like It has kind of an ah-ish quality to it. So the crazy thing, because, you know, we're thorough aliens, so we now want to look at, well, what else is going on in the sound of this instrument? And this is everything else. And I want to suggest there's kind of two uh, perceptual objects here. We have... The low fundamental. And then we have a much brighter part of the sound. And like I said, I mean, singers use contrast and opposition to create meaning within their music. Um, and I think we can describe these two different sounds in terms of essentially how they're different. Like, how, how are they contrasting? I would say one of them is pure and one of them is buzzy. If I take the pure in and out, you'll notice it coming in and out in contrast to the bright part that's buzzy. And then if we fade that frequency bandwidth where we would find the first and second vowel formant for the human voice, if we fade that back in, I just want you all to try to notice, you know, within the limits of what we're able to do broadcasting sound over the internet, just try to notice that um, essentially the bright buzzy part and the warm ooey part persist, even as I bring that middle frequency range back in. So there's really sort of at minimum, there's three color qualities that are present within that cello at all times. So if we apply the same, same thing to this voice, I think the people at Bell Labs were right. That is where the, the core of the ah is. But it leaves out this. Which, just like the cello, you'll notice has a very bright, buzzy part. and also has a very warm, pure part. So if we took the same approach and essentially removed the part that all of us have been told is the vowel part of the sound, and then bring it back in, I just want you to notice that the buzzy part and the pure ooh part essentially both persist. It is. And I've heard you say that because of the work you do, you can really perceptually hear these different sounds as you listen now. You, you... Um, and But you know what gives me hope is so can all of my graduate students. Mm -hmm. That's that ear training that you said in doing the ear, a different ear training than we all think of ear training classes. Exactly right. Exactly. Right. Um, so that's kind of the 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 way to, that I like to start to introduce this idea is, is just, first of all, there's more going on than we think. Mm -hmm. right? And if you can just train your ear a little bit to notice these properties, you can really notice them.
And then as just, you know, I'll, I'll hope to argue, um, if we're spending all this time as an industry saying that it's important to be looking at spectrograms, um, we should at least be able to start thinking about, well, what does this part of the spectrogram sound like? What does this part of the spectrogram sound like? Can I notice, you know, those two parts separately? Can I notice when we change the relationship of intensity of those two parts? Um, so thinking about timbre, because uh, that's essentially the, my overarching field of study is just timbre. Timbre has a kitchen sink definition. It is everything but pitch and loudness. And um, sometimes it's also uh, everything but pitch, loudness, and duration. Um, essentially, everybody who works in timbre thinks this is a, a pretty ridiculous definition. It's um, a definition by negation, and it's overly broad. So I have two questions, then. I, I, I divide it primarily like the main upper hierarchy division is what sonic qualities unfold over time and then what sonic qualities are unfolded. Um, there are some fancy words for this. We say they're temporally variant or temporally invariant. So a temporally variant aspect of timbre simply means for it to exist, time must be passing. Like we, we experience the phenomenon as time passes, Vibrato is a great example of this. You can take any one frozen moment of time and you won't be able to capture the character of the vibrato. Time has to pass for us to experience it. The smallest discrete unit of a crescendo, timbrally, is the entire crescendo. You can't talk about any one slice of it and have it be representative of the larger scale um, aspects. So this is exciting because timbre generally asks us what's different between two sounds. Tambra is asking us everything that differentiates two sounds besides pitch and loudness and sometimes duration. If we look at temporally invariant aspects of timbre, and I'll tell you what these are in just a second, this asks us what two sounds have in common with each other. So I'll give you another example here. This is a voice singing an oo e oo. we can see that there is a essentially a first formant, a first resonated spectral peak, um, for a uh, radiated spectral peak, excuse me, um, that they both have in common. And then anybody who knows their F1, F2 charts knows that the second formant rises up for E, drops back down for the O. So just like with the cello in the voice, um, where that fundamental had a distinct tonal quality and was sort of the same between the cello and the voice. If we listen to just that fundamental in this voice, check this out. So then I think a reasonable person would ask where the E sound went. Mm -hmm. And then we can come to understand that the E doesn't live in that harmonic. All the sounds that we'll hear as the E are in those higher frequency ranges. And in fact, if I fade the fundamental back in, what I want you to imagine, and I, I imagine puppets sometimes with this stuff, that you have like an E puppet that keeps singing, and then there's like an O puppet, that comes in when I bring the fundamentals power up. So again, there's contrasts and oppositions there. And what I want to suggest is that the tonal color of that fundamental is, it has its tonal color essentially just because of the frequency that it has. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason. If that, if that frequency is strongly represented within an E vowel, it will still exhibit the same tonal color no matter what. And so what I'd like to challenge everybody to do then is listen to this oo e u passage and see if you can hear the oo persist. See if you can hear the e rising up above it and then dropping back down.
Isn't that weird? We, we, it is. We have just a, let me pause really quickly for a couple. So um, this is so cute. Ar Arl says, mind blown, Eve Owl is taking the upper frequencies only then. Eval is taking the upper frequencies only. What I would say is that what we know as an eval is already an incredibly complex combination of different colors. And um, one of those colors happens to be the defining quality of the uval. Uh, I'm, I'm positive this will not work with the microphones and, and the internet that we have going. Um, but I, everybody try this. Like when you go to teach a lesson tomorrow, have a singer sing an E, E, and have them decrescendo just to the sliver, like the smallest sliver of a sound that they can produce. Um, we want to get it as as weak and as warm only as possible. And if you go right up to their ear, uh, right up to their mouth and listen, it'll actually sound more like an O than it will like an E, mm -hmm. because they're underpowering the higher the higher resonances. They're underpowering the higher part of the spectrum, and you have to have that to have that objective sound. Mm -hmm. Now I could say, I could say, plays baby, plays. Like I could say that and everybody would hear the word please. Like they, they, they've they gone through the process of language cognition. Um, I didn't make an E sound, but I achieved sort of an E linguistically. So that's a slightly different consideration. I'm just thinking about the, the pure sound that it is that we're listening to. I love this, my colleague Sandy Hirsch, um, who works a lot with transgender she's very very well known and she says this is exactly why we use e in trans feminine work and u in trans masculine work oh fun that's interesting yeah that's fascinating um and then one thing uh, karen brunson says if you cover your mouth while singing e you will hear the u vowel so it's uh, similar to what you were um, talking about. And one last thing, Deeper is More says the buzz on the cello sounds, so we're backing up for just a moment. Mm -hmm. The buzz on the cello sounds like strings scratching on the bow. I thought that as well. Is yeah. that similar to vocal sibilance, sibilance maybe? So I think that there were two sounds that were present within the cello. I think there was um, sort of, there were non-periodic qualities that show up on the spectrogram is essentially in between the harmonics. There is an, another another color that is present that is the, the brightness of the higher harmonics that we saw on the spectrogram. So I think there are actually those two perceptual things that were happening simultaneously. Um, something like like sibilance just has no periodicity at all. Like we, we don't hear a pitch at all. So, so I think the, the scratchy parts that he heard are probably not dissimilar from that. Um, but there was this other bright quality present in the cello that wouldn't be present in the S. Okay, thanks for the great questions already. Um, and thanks for letting us kind of flow through those a bit, oh, Ian. Absolutely. Well, so there's basically three things that I want to introduce. And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on each of these just a little bit tonight. Um, concept of pitch, concept of auditory roughness, and the concept of tone color. Um, so pitch is actually a pretty big idea that's missing from voice pedagogy, I think. Um, most people, when they look at a spectrogram, they'll tend to think, oh, the bottom line is the pitch and everything else is the color. But the fundamental is not the same thing as the pitch. Um, in fact, we hear the pitch whether the fundamental is present or not, uh, because pitch itself is a cognitive experience. Um, and I can demonstrate this with the Mata Voice Synthesizer. Everybody say it with me. Ah. There it is. Okay. If I remove the fundamental, this experience of the pitch does not change. Hmm. Now, what did change was the color. There was a timbral change, but the pitch itself did not change. We have known about this property for so long that the analog telephone system is based on this premise, that you can remove energy below a certain frequency, and the pitch of a speaking voice will persist. Analog telephone cuts off all information below about three or 400 hertz. So that's right toward the bottom of the treble staff. And um, you know, for my entire 
childhood. I spoke and when there were males speaking on the other end of an analog telephone, I didn't think that their voice jumped up an octave just because the fundamental wasn't present. And this is the same, Jeff uh, Costello is saying that's the same with an AM radio. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, honestly, my little speaker on my iPhone, you know, that, that little speaker has a, 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 a roll off in the lower frequencies. Um, bass guitars are not particularly well represented timbrally uh, on an iPhone speaker, yet we still hear the pitches that the bass guitars are playing. Um, so pitch, if we think about it in terms of what we see in a spectrogram, uh, pitch, the pitch percept is generated by the lowest eight harmonics, give or take. There's a little bit of disagreement about this, and I think it's a little bit context dependent. Um, higher harmonics than about the eighth harmonic do contribute, but they do so to a lesser extent. This is one of my favorite examples, and I, I certainly hope this comes across well. Um, over the internet transmission. So let's have these markers show up. Okay. So I, I just want to pay attention to Dmitry Horostovsky's um, singers forming cluster for just a second. So I'm going to play two pitches. Um, this first pitch is his singer's formant cluster when his fundamental is low enough that the harmonics that constitute the singer's formant cluster are very high in the harmonic series. And so as a result, um, we're not really going to hear the pitch. I just want to contrast that with this. This is a higher fundamental. Now, most people are not surprised that this pitch is this. Most people are surprised that this So when you're that much higher in a harmonic series, um, the sound that we hear tends to, it's more like noise. It's not noise like broadband white noise, um, but it still has a noisy quality rather than a, a clear pitched quality. So then if we go back to that very first image I showed, the question is, where's the pitch? So then we can actually pretty easily say, here's the pitch. The pitch resides within the lowest eight, eight or nine harmonics. Auditory roughness is the second uh, psychoacoustic property I think is very important for us to be thinking about. It's a buzzy perceptual quality, and it arises when multiple stimuli, and that can be harmonics, that can be noise, reverberation of vibrato, sort of uh, spreading energy across a, wire a wider frequency band, fall within what's called a critical band of hearing. Um, now, a critical band of hearing is a measure of the limitation of this structure within the cochlea, which is in your inner ear. It's a measure of the limitation of that structure's ability to resolve frequency. Um, above about a C5, a critical band is about a minor third. So I'm gonna play some examples uh, for this because I don't want it to be too confusing. At much lower pitches, uh, it's wider, but a minor third is a pretty good rule of thumb for singing, voice study. So I'm going to open two instances of mana. I'm going to turn them both into sine tone generators. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these two harmonics um, about a fifth apart.
And as I bring the top note closer to the lower note, I want you to start to notice we're going to get into like beating, that kind of sound. So we're finally at a unison. Um, now, if that's that's probably the sort of sound sample that unfortunately is not going to come across quite as well um, through uh, the webinar format. But what we can notice is if we think about the harmonic series, essentially once we hit the fifth harmonic, so if we just look on this piano keyboard, first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic, every harmonic interval above that is going to be a minor third or smaller. So I'm going to add these harmonics. And what I want you to try to notice is once I add above the fifth harmonic, you're going to start to hear a buzzy quality come in. So this is the same phenomenon that we experienced in the cello and the voice. And in fact, if I cut the lowest five harmonics out and just leave this, we'll just be left with buzz. If I do the opposite and just have the lowest five harmonics of the spectrum be present instead, we'll just have pure. So this is a schematic that just illustrates this idea that up to what we would see through a Fourier transform as about the fifth harmonic, all the sounds are pure. From about the fifth harmonic and higher, they're rough or rougher. So the fun thing is this allows us to have a, just in practical terms, what we'd call a two timbre model, just the pure part of the sound versus the rough part of the sound. And if you think about pitch being the lowest eight harmonics, um, some of the, all of the purity resolves into the pitch. Some of the, the um, roughness will also resolve into the pitch. So then if we just think about like a couple basic spectra that most of us think about, um, we have phonation quality, breathy, pressed, and flow phonation. Those are fairly common terms that we use. Breathy, we know, has a steep roll off of harmonics. Pressed has a very closer to flat roll off of harmonics. And flow has a strong fundamental and um, a less precipitous drop off in the power of the higher harmonics. So then we can just say, well, this part's pure and this part's buzzy. This part's pure, this part's buzzy. This part is pure and this part is buzzy. And we can see that what breathy lacks is the buzzy part of the sound. What flow has that pressed does not is the pure part of the sound, though they both have some strong buzz. And we can also map this onto our concepts of what our vibratory modes are as well. We have our, our thyroidinoid release or our thyroidinoid engage, which we might call mode two and mode one um, by some systems. Again, we have a pure part of the sound and a buzzy part of the sound. And um, you know, one of the ideas that I'd love to, to push out into the world is even something as basic as chest voice. Like how do we talk about what chest voice is from a non-production point of view? Because we, we can talk about the physiological configurations all day long. Uh, but you know, if it doesn't tell you what it sounds like, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's helpful. Um, and I, I think we should start defining chest voice as auditory roughness. Chest voice has a buzzy sound. And this is why um, vocal fold configurations that are not as pure in terms of the thyroid engagement as you might get in a lower modal range or a lower chest voice range can create the illusion of being blended with chest voice. Because, you know, by, by whatever means, if it's by adduction of other means, if it's by vocal track tuning so that you're getting um, the inertance of the, the air in the vocal tract so you get um, more vocal fold closure for less muscular force, whatever it is, what, what we're talking about in all these mixy ranges is essentially we're adding buzziness. We're mm -hmm. adding auditory roughness. 
So then where's the roughness? The roughness is here. The roughness is from about the fifth harmonic and higher. So absolute spectral tone color, um, of all the ideas that I've, I've put out uh, in my dissertation and, and subsequent article and the various presentations uh, that I've given, absolute spectral tone color is the one that people really latch onto. Um, the basic idea is there's an identical tone color uh, percept, like we perceive an identical tone color uh, based on frequency, regardless of source. Doesn't matter what the source is. These tone colors can be placed along a continuum and they bear a meaningful similarity to several vowels. Um, you can essentially think of it as what some people call the oral resonance or the, um, the second vocal tract resonance or the second formant of non-mixed vowels. So let's actually do this. I just wanna play a melody with a sign tone. And what I want you to notice is that the, the color, if we were gonna anthropomorphize it, like say what I would do with my mouth to imitate this sound, the color is gonna open. And then it'll close. And the timbral variation that took place um, took place entirely because of how the ear processes the sound. And this is so dependable that if I, instead of using that sign tone generator, I take this sample of white noise. And just so like nothing up my sleeve, this is actual white noise. And if I narrowly notch filter it so that I'm stimulating essentially the same part of your inner ear, Listen to the color of that. Like it has an identical color. So I'm not, certainly not the first person to suggest that this might be true. Um, there's a long history of thinking about brightness and psychoacoustics. And to a psychoacoustician, brightness is essentially the equivalent to the scale of frequency. And we've been talking about this since at least Ernst Mach. Um, he's the guy who the Mach scale is named after. Um, and this is the scale that I propose. Um, and it's it's held up in terms of the uh, tests that I've run and I've come at a couple of different ways. And it's a fairly sensical way, I think, to think about what the, the color of a simple sound is. Um, now, it's beyond well beyond the scope of what we can talk about tonight, but the way that that might manifest within a complex sound is a slightly different question. So we'll just hold that idea. But if we ask where's the tone color then, we would say that this lowest harmonic is most like an ooh in its color. This next cluster is like ah. This next cluster is like e. And then we have a very bright e part at the top. So then if we try to put it all together, we would say that there's pitch and roughness. And that the spectrum itself has um, discrete sections that have specific tonal qualities. And I'll just play this sample real quick. Okay, so this is the voice, first off. So then the question is just, does the framework accurately predict what these various parts of the spectrum sound like? This is that first harmonic that we saw on the spectrum. Uh, this is like an ooh. 
This is the next cluster. This is going to sound most like an awe, and it will be pure. This is the next cluster. It will sound predominantly like an E, and it will have a buzzy quality. It will still be in the pitch, though. So the tone color changed, but the roughness purity changed as well. And then we have an even higher frequency range, which we basically never talk about. Uh, in the classical female voice, and this is going to be unresolved, so it won't be part of the pitch, and it'll be a very bright E sound. It's like crickets. So then we can add these parts of the voice back together, and I just want you to see if you can notice that uh, these qualities persist. We'll add the ooh. this points to, and, and maybe this will be like the, the idea that I leave you all with, um, where this points to is we can start to think about registration through this lens, because if we have this same singer jump up an octave, fun stuff starts to happen. So first of all, if we look in the ooh range, you can see the ooh only exists for the A flat four. It's just not there at all for the A flat five. What we would see on a spectrogram, this singer's fundamental is already at a higher tone color than the ooh is. So her first color in the A flat five is going to be here. And this already sounds more like awe does. Mm -hmm. um, so she's already singing above ooh, which is just sort of a fascinating thing to think about. Um, some of these higher frequency ranges, this E that is super buzzy at the low note uh, becomes more pure at the high note. And then the part that I love, and, and we did a, a voice foundation presentation on this this past summer, is the higher frequency, the, the frequency range higher than the singer's form cluster would be found in a male. In, in this female voice at an A-flat five is actually resolved into the pitch mm -hmm. and has auditory roughness. It has this buzziness, uh, which is exactly what the singer's formant cluster is in a male voice, perceptually. You know, mechanically, just in terms of the means of production, I, I think there are certainly differences. Uh, but just check out the way the sound changes. So it goes from something that is very sort of noisy and has no pitch to it to something that has point and has pitch and has distinct color. Um, so I think probably for the timing, and you know, this is this is on me because my my computer broke and I had to restart. So I apologize to everybody for that. Um, I don't want to go over your time limit. Um, so if you want to, we if you have another ten minutes, we would be thrilled, uh, Ian. Great. Great. Um, so I, I think if we can think about it this way. I think we're used to looking at spectrograms and power spectrums and thinking essentially that we, like we can take away contour things from it or we can get a sense of what the vibrato is. And those, those are great. Those are great ways to use the tools. But I think there's actually a mind-numbing amount of sonic information in an image like this, um, essentially if you know how to see it, if you know what it is um, 
that every part of the spectrum will sound like based on whether it's in the pitch or not, whether it is a pure sound or a rough sound, and then um, what the tone color contributions of, um, of those various parts of the spectrum can possibly be. And um, th this just lets you have a perceptual model where you have a pure part and a rough part, a resolved part and an unresolved part. And then the way that those three things combine is there's like a pure and resolved part, a rough and resolved part, and a rough and unresolved part. I think anybody who studies operatic tenors, um, you know, you should be aware that just when the voice kind of starts to, to bloom and get interesting, um, you know, sort, sort of approaching the bottom of the treble staff, that's right around the frequency range where the singer's formant cluster stops being unresolved. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a noisy sort of cricket-like sound in a lower male classical voice that once pitch rises high enough, um, gains focus and gains clarity and starts to become part of the pitch, as you would see here, becomes rough and resolved. Um, and, and I think that this also can really point toward thinking about the classical female voice in different ways. Um, we tend to set our spectrograms when we when we either you know work on our iPads or our iPhones or on our laptops and we're using them. We tend to go up to four or five thousand hertz um, because that's the frequency range that the telephone company research told us we didn't really have to exceed in order to capture what was relevant to understanding the, the speaking voice. Um, I, I recommend everybody put the upper limit of your spectrogram up to 12,000 hertz, 15,000 hertz. There's really interesting stuff that's going on there in the classical female voice that is perceptually relevant and contributes something meaningful to the sound of the singer. It doesn't, it doesn't contribute anything linguistic. I think that's a really important thing to say. It contributes nothing linguistic. It contributes amazing things perceptually in terms of the color of the voice. And think again, we'll, we'll be our space aliens and we've come down to earth and we wanna study this cello. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't put this artificial um, boundary on the part of the spectrum that we're studying um, because the cello doesn't have language. Nobody listens to a cello and wonders like, is that Czech? Is that German? Like, I don't know. Um, is that an awe or an ah? Like, nobody thinks that about a cello. You just, because there's no language in a cello we're we're willing to just accept the sound as it is. Um, and I think we should start doing that with the singing voice. Mm. Because there's a lot of color in the singing voice that's that's experientially amazing. And if you want to think about vocal fold function, I think it's actually pretty easy to, to draw direct correlation between, how do we pull this back up? Direct correlation, to, you know, if you think about how the vocal folds work, and essentially we have sort of excursion, right? And, as a model, this suffers, of course, but we have how far from the midline they come before they come together, and then we have how deep they contact. Um, you should be able to correlate, essentially, the, the excursion from the midline with the power of the fundamental, right? Pressed phonation has a decreased fundamental because we're, we're forcing the folds to, to not come together to come together much, much sooner within the potential range of motion of them. Flow phonation is great because we get that big excursion of the vocal folds. Um, and then the other thing is just the depth of contact and how quickly the folds close. So it, it's, it's a little complicated and beyond what I think we can really get into tonight, but essentially how they close, how the, the pressure that rises in the vocal tract as the folds are open and the air is flowing past and it, it creates a push into the, the air that's within the vocal tract. Essentially, it's how quickly that pressure drops, gets us what we perceive as higher harmonics. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a you know, that is not the vocal folds going snap, snap. That's the vocal folds in very thin, very sinusoidal motion. Um, so that means that auditory roughness should be our aural cue that we're getting greater depth of vocal fold contact, mm -hmm. um, which again is the way we trick people into thinking we're singing in chest voice, when instead we're not actually really in a fully contracted thyroidinoid position. Um, so it's even practical on that level. If you, if you do nothing but just notice like, oh, there's a fundamental that mostly sounds like ooh, 
above about C5, it'll open to an O and then eventually just joins the meat of the, the sound of a, a female voice higher than the treble staff. Um, if you can just notice that and just notice there's a zzz quality in the sound, you're already on your way to like elite functional listening <laughs> because you'll be able to tell whether the vocal folds are, are being pushed into each other or really nicely rippling in the flow of air. And you'll be able to tell whether you're getting good vocal fold contact from top to bottom. And all of this is to say nothing of how we should be listening to contemporary singing. Uh, I mean, as soon as you, if you accept that we have to include radiation and perception in our basic subsystems of the voice, then the signal chain of a singer who sings with a microphone is part of how that sound radiates. And if you have a singer who is using a lot of compression on as a part of their signal chain and perhaps has equalized the, the, the signal in some way, um, for their aesthetic goals, if it's going to create higher frequency energy, that's going to come across as auditory roughness. Mm -hmm. And you know, as my colleague Chadley point, pointed out in your last uh, two sessions ago, I think, um, you know, you look at some of these commercial singers, look at David Lee Roth, look at Freddie Mercury, and they have their spectrum is lit all the way up to the top. Mm -hmm. And and how we can confront a voice like that by saying, well, you have your first and your second vowel formant of ah, and we have captured the nature of Freddie Mercury's voice. Like it just on its face, it seems to fall short. That's fascinating. I and I think I'm somewhat reading. Um, Nick says uh, Nicholas Perna says Ian might want to mention that depending on the compression of the recording or the limit of the microphone, expanding to 15,000 hertz um, might not make a difference. But if the recording or mic allows, it absolutely will. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, and you know. To say nothing of even just like classical recordings, if you, right. if you take a, an older recording and then a remastered recording, uh, oftentimes they'll be remastering equalization that's put in to try to replace um, depowered areas of the spectrum in older recordings. So, you're, but but put it up to 15k and look. Mm -hmm. Just look. If you have Voce Vista Video Pro, um, look and put a frequency filter on and listen. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. You really start to understand the power of this stuff when you listen to what you're seeing on the spectrogram and see if it's perceptually relevant or not. Well, Ian, you have such a way of making all of this accessible. In fact, I'm getting some really lovely comments about, wow, I'm finally understanding some of this for the first time tonight. And yeah. um, and, and you've already, I was gonna ask for further reading, of Good. course, the dissertation and then the Voice Prince article. Are you gonna be speaking at the uh, Voice Foundation coming up in June? I'm not. I'm actually taking a summer off from uh, from conferences this summer, but I'll be back at it the next year. And then you you discuss this in your summer acoustics yeah. pedagogy with Ken and Chadley. Yeah. So thanks for the chance to say something about that. So I mean, I I find the the whole field of voice acoustics, singing voice perception, and so that's what we hear, but also it's it's what we feel like how can the body possibly feel, is a really exciting, really exciting subfield of voice pedagogy right now. And um, Ken Chadley and I, our, our material just meshes really beautifully and complements and overlaps. And I think there's something unique that each of us are able to, to offer attendees. So this will be covered in excruciating detail over the course of a week um, mm -hmm. at the end of June um, here in Boston at, at New England Conservatory. Um, and let's see on my slide. Yeah, so there's there's my dissertation and also this article and there's bibliographies in both of those. Um, it's not an easy read, but if anybody wants to jump in just on psychoacoustics, get a book called The Intelligent Ear by Rainier Plomp. It was um, 2002, 2003, I think. And th this was a guy who in the 60s, like his dissertation did the thing we all want our dissertations to do where like, redefined a field <laughs> um, and and so all of he, he like he had a lifetime of research 50 year research career and then he writes this book toward the end of that so it, it's very um, thoughtful and reflective and sort of goes into a lot of uh, the phenomena that underpin um, how it is that we can possibly perceive sound well Ian thank you so much for helping us to think differently and more importantly listen differently um, it's just invaluable. And I just want to remind everyone that the next Nats chat will be April 14th with uh, Scott McCoy. And the topic is the more things change, the more they stay the same. So I will look forward to that. We're getting lots and lots of thank yous from everyone, Ian, for your contribution tonight. So 
Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you for your patience during yeah. our little technical challenge. And um, I hope to see you all in April. Good night. Ian, just